<laughs> Welcome, my name is Peter Zipfel and I invite you to a webinar that I gave a few years ago under the auspices of AIAA, which is the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, while I was teaching at the University of Florida. I was answering the question why Newtonian flight dynamics is a special case of Einstein's relativity. So I gave it the title Flight Dynamics and Einstein's Covariance Principle. As you will see, the covariance principle of Einstein's general relativity has a direct bearing on how we model flight dynamics for modern computer usage. So let's get started right away. Well, here is my titled slide. Flight Dynamics and Einstein's Covariance Principle. And as I promised, I will answer the question why Newtonian flight dynamics is a special case of Einstein's relativity. After teaching for about 35 years at the University of Florida and having been a member over 50 years with AIAA, I'm using now my company Modeling and Simulation Technologies to bring you this seminar. And it is a seminar on modern flight dynamics, and I will bring it to you in four parts. First, we're going to go from Einstein to flight dynamics, and I will explain how I use Einstein's principle and apply them to flight dynamics. Then a discussion on the foundations of dynamics. What principles govern dynamics? And how these principles are affecting flight dynamics and how flight dynamics is best expressed in tensors. And then we're going to look uh, forward what other resources are available, and what may be some of the next steps you may be taking. Well, the core of Einstein's relativity is the covariance principle. So let's just read how he stated it in a publication 1911. Natural laws must be covariant with respect to arbitrary continuous transformations of the coordinates. Which really means that the laws of physics have the same form in all coordinate systems. Or another way to express this is the laws of physics are invariant, that is covariant, under all coordinate transformations. So what kind of coordinate systems do we have? Well, there are two types. One are the inertial coordinate systems, the so-called non-accelerating coordinate systems, on which the special theory of relativity is based. If you have two inertial coordinate systems and you look at the transformation between the two coordinate systems, the transformation elements are independent of time. The other category are the accelerating coordinate systems on which the general theory of relativity is based. Here, if you look at the transformation matrix of two of these coordinate systems, you will see that the elements are time dependent. One can say yes, there is a centrifugal acceleration between these coordinate systems. And here you see uh, on the right-hand side uh, Einstein's favorite example of these accelerated coordinate systems, which is the merry-go-round. So who was Albert Einstein? Well, he was born 1879 in Ulm, Germany, went to high school there, and then he moved to Bern, Switzerland first to uh, complete his studies. 
and then he qualified in Zurich for uh, academic work and uh, he was there at the ETH, which is the Eidgenössische Technische Hochschule of Zurich. He graduated with honor but couldn't get a job there as an instructor, so he went back to Bern and uh, worked there at the uh, Office of Patent. And in 1905, while he was there, he published his very seminal paper on special relativity. Its title translated in English is on the electrodynamics of moving bodies. Now, while he was in Bern, uh, he lived in the Kramgasse 49 on the second floor and his desk had a window looking out over the road, the street below. And there he saw a boy, as it is told, who was running with his friends. And he just enjoyed the picture. After publishing his paper on special relativity there in Bern, the word spread around that uh, the faster a body moves, the shorter it gets. So on one of his walks along the Kramgasse, Einstein met this boy and asked him, well, I don't see you running any longer with your friends. What's wrong? And the boy answered, Herr Einstein, I want to grow tall as my friends. But my mother told me that you said the faster a boy runs, the shorter he gets. Well, that's just a story, and I'm sure that this young boy grew up to become a tall Swiss young man. Now, the General Relativity paper was published in 1911, and uh, in 1960 he wrote a popular version of the Relativity that was for the consummation of the general audience, which was also then published in 1952, prior to his death, in Dover. Well, Einstein left Zurich in 1914 because he had become famous now, and uh, the director of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute at that time Max Planck called him there to Berlin, and Einstein eventually became the director of that institute himself. But uh, in 1933, the Nazis uh, became uh, rather obnoxious and uh, formulated uh, the fact that Jewish professors should not be teaching in Germany. So he saw the handwriting on the wall and he left for America and joined the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton, New Jersey, where he then, uh, after many, many years of very productive life, died in 1955. Now Einstein's hobby was playing the violin. And he said, I get most of my joy out of music. As a matter of fact, he said that uh, when I contemplate physics, I feel like thinking in terms of music. And he also said, if I were not a physicist, I probably would be a musician. So the violin played an important part in his life just as it plays an important part in my life. Well, in the tradition of Einstein, I'm going to play you on my violin an intermezzo entitled Flight Dynamics. <laughs> ¶¶ 
apologize to listen to my lecture here, first part from Einstein to flight dynamics. After this musical interlude, we have to get serious and talk about Einstein and flight dynamics. And I will talk about my goals of this seminar, the assertions that lead to these conclusions that I will draw, and then discuss in some more detail special relativity, particularly with this carriage Gedanken experiment that Einstein so loved, and general relativity. So my goals are here to convince you, just I had to convince myself, that classical dynamics is part of Einstein's relativity. And what are the consequences for flight dynamics? With some examples, I will illustrate it and then give you some more information on resources for further studies. So here are my three assumptions. The covariance principle is the foundation also for classical dynamics because it is universally valid. And just as Einstein used tensors, tensors are best suited to model kinematics and dynamics. And because of that, the flight dynamics is modeled in tensors. The tensors are converted to matrices by introducing coordinate systems, and then we can use these wonderful programs we have to manipulate and solve matrix equations. So let's first talk about inertial coordinates. If you remember in the transformation matrices between inertial coordinates are constant. Their elements are constant. And that was the basis for special relativity. So let's compare classical dynamics and special relativity. Of course, in classical dynamics, Newton's second law is invariant and is the basis for our discussion. And the Galilean transformation is as important, that is, additions of velocities. And there's only one universal clock. Simultaneity is universal. Now special relativity is based on electrodynamics. It was James Clark Maxwell, a Scot, who brought together electricity, magnetism, and light in what we call today the electromagnetic spectrum. And uh, in his theoretical development, he postulated that the speed of light must be constant. And that's where Einstein picked up. And in 1905, published that very important paper, which in German is entitled to Electrodynamic Bewegter Körper, translated on electrodynamics of moving bodies. So the speed of light is constant, but the Galilean transformation is not valid anymore in special relativity. Well, it's a special case for very small velocities, but if we have very fast velocities, we have to use the Lorentz transformation. And there is no universal clock anymore. The simultaneity is now dependent on the reference frames. We only have local clocks. And part of, because of this, uh, the consequences are for, bo for bodies that are moving very fast, that the time stretches and the length contract. Now let's go to a very famous experiment that Einstein so loved. And we're going to look at it in classical dynamics and special relativity. So this is the 
carriage experiment. Here we have a carriage, uh, and in the center of the carriage, an explosion takes place. Now the carriage is moving with the velocity w to the right. And we have two observers in that carriage, one on the right and one on the left. And they both experience the sound at the same speed. And the speed of sound here is called a. Now let's say we have also two observers uh, on the uh, outside. And uh, one on the right hand side and one on the left hand side. The one on the right hand side, which sees the carriage approaching, if he could, he would hear the sound at the speed of V equals A plus W. While the observer on the left hand side, who sees the carriage receding, experiences the sound with a velocity A minus W. So that is that famous Doppler effect that we are all familiar with. Now let's turn to special relativity. We got the same carriage, but now a spark, a light spark is set off in a center. And we have again uh, two observers inside the carriage on the right and the left. And the carriage is moving again with the speed of W to the right. Now those inside observers, if they could, they, well, they would see the light approaching them at the same speed of light called C. But let's go to the observer outside. Again, there's one on the right hand and the left hand. And now here comes the shocker. Both observers, even though the carriage in one case is approaching and in the other case is receding, they both see the light at the same speed. Matter of fact, it has the same frequency. So that took uh, the scientific community quite uh, by uh, surprise, and it took a while until that settles in. But today there is no question that this is true, because it can be experimentally verified. Now we turn to general relativity and to accelerated coordinates. Accelerated coordinates, if they're related by transformation matrices, their transformation matrices have elements that are time dependent now. On the side of the general relativity, uh, the covariance principle has been established by Einstein which says that laws of physics have the same form in all coordinate systems. And of course, Newton's law is also a law of physics. Now, in general relativity, uh, Einstein uses the Riemannian space, very complex, the metric is given by mass distribution, <coughs> and he formulated his equations with what was then called the Ricci tensors. Now we, in classical dynamics, we can use Euclidean space, where the metric is constant. As a matter of fact, we use a subset, uh, which is the Cartesian space, and uh, use Cartesian tensors. Just as an aside, uh, the general relativity also postulates the equivalence principle. 
that laws of gravity and inertia are equivalent. Just imagine you are in an elevator, and that's the example that Einstein uses, and the elevator is just at rest and you feel that your whole body is pushed down to the floor, and you would attribute this to gravity. Now let's take that same elevator into a point in space where there is no gravity, it's some kind of a neutral space. And now that elevator is accelerating upward. And again, you would have exactly the same feeling that something is pressing you down on the floor. You would not be able to distinguish whether you are pressed down by gravity or by the inertia effect. So that's what he formulated as the law of gravity and inertia are equivalent. But let's go back to classical dynamics and the consequences for us. Well, the consequences are that we have to distinguish between coordinate systems and frames. And I will go into this in more detail later. And uh, in order to formulate our equations, in a invariant form and tensor form, we need uh, two elements, kinematic elements, the rotational time derivative and Euler's transformation of frames. And that is what I call tensor dynamics. Well, we have come to the end of this section and uh, now if it were a real live webinar, I would ask you those questions. Are you an engineer? Are you a physicist, mathematician, philosopher? And of course, everybody could say, I am a human being. And I would get that feedback and get kind of a feel for who my audience is. But in this case, since I don't know your audience, uh, you've got to answer that for yourself. And uh, we're going to be moving on then into our next section. Well, since we're just one-on-one, -on -one, let me guess uh, you're a physicist, right? Well, well. Let me guess that you're a human being. I'll be always right with that. <laughs> but let's press on with our second part, the foundation of dynamics. And of course, classical dynamics is based on Newton's laws, and in our case, particularly uh, Newton's second law. But those dynamics are also supported by very important kinematic features. And so I will talk about position, velocity, and uh, some kinematic tools we need to formulate our tensor flight dynamics. So let's get started. Sir Isaac Newton is the father of what we call now classical dynamics. So we're going to look at his second law and some of the kinematic tools that support it. Well, what is modern Newtonian mechanics? It is based on Einstein's postulate that all physical laws are invariant under all coordinate transformations, which I call the, well, Einstein called the covariance principle. So since Newton's law is also a law of physics, it also must be invariant under all coordinate transformations. And therefore, it is a tensor concept. And to support it, we also model kinematics by tensors. 
and we're gonna leave behind our cherished vector mechanics of the past. So let's get specific and now I have to slow down a little bit to explain everything. Well here in vector dynamics we have the time rate of change of linear momentum with respect to inertial coordinates equals the externally applied forces. Now if we want to express that law in body coordinates, we have this extra term W cross multiplied by P. And that adds an extra term in this presentation. So Newton's law is not the same in all coordinate systems. And because of that, it is not a tensor formulation. Well, let's look at tensor dynamics. Here again, we got P, this time bolded because it is a tensor of rank one. It is the linear momentum and is subject to the D, capital D operator, which we call the rotational time derivative with respect to frame i, i is the superscript, expressed in coordinates i, inertial coordinates i. And that's why we put these brackets around it. And on the right hand side, the force is also expressed in inertial coordinates. Now if you want to express it in body coordinates, all we have to do is just replace the superscript i by b. And what enables this kind of representation is this rotational time derivative. Because if it is operating on a tensor, this tensor remains a tensor. It keeps its tensor characteristics. And because of this, we can have this transformation of the left right hand side to the left hand side. The right hand side expressed in I coordinates, the left hand side expressed in B coordinates. And the transformation is a transformation matrix of, and in this case we could call B the body coordinates relative to the inertial coordinates. And this is a typical tensor transformation of a tensor of rank 1 valid for all coordinate transformations, be they inertial coordinates or be they in, uh, accelerated coordinates. So since this formulation is valid in all coordinates, we can just drop specific coordinates and now we have this tensor formulation of Newton's law, which is the linear momentum operated on by this rotational derivative, which is reference to the reference frame I equals the externally applied forces F. And what's here very important is that in tensor dynamics, we very carefully distinguish between frames and coordinate systems. And that is not done in vector dynamics. Usually frames and coordinate systems are considered as synonyms. So vector dynamics is not a tensor formulation. Tensor dynamics is a tensor formulation. Now let's get very practical and just talk about position. And again, compare vector kinematics with tensor kinematics, or I guess I should say vector geometry with tensor geometry. And particularly, 
we're going to look at this point B that uh, in the left hand side is reference to an origin O of two coordinate systems that are coinciding a coordinate system A and a coordinate system C. So this point B is reference to point O by the radius vector R and we indicate it by an arrow over bar. Now on the right hand side uh, we also reference B but we reference B to another point A because in space there is no absolute reference. Even though in vector kinematics we kind of pretend that this O is a absolute reference but that is not the physics of the problem. That's just computationally convenient. The physics on the right hand side are specific and they say that B has to be a reference to another point A. And as you see the coordinate systems are free floating. Uh, they don't have an origin. And the nomenclature here is S bolded subscript which makes it a tensor of rank 1 and the subscripts are B with respect to A. Now let's look at the components. Well on the left hand side the radius vector is referred to the A coordinates and has three components. On the right hand side the uh, tensor of rank 1 is expressed in A coordinates and now it becomes a 3 by 1 matrix and you see here the nomenclature on the right hand side these three elements which now are numbers. Now let's look at position triangles another exercise in geometry and we're going to again compare vector kinematics to tensor kinematics. Alright, now on the left hand side we have separated out the two coordinate systems so now we have two origins O superscript A and O superscript C and there are two types of radius vectors R superscript A and R superscript C and uh, the connection between the two origins is expressed by this vector Q superscript C which really is also a radius vector of the coordinate system C. So as we add them together RC equals RA plus QC. Now let's look at the tensor kinematics. There are no origins. We only have points in space A, B, C. And uh, this A, B, C really is exists without coordinate systems. These points don't need coordinate systems to exist. And so this is a tensor relationship that I am written here. SBC equals SBA plus SAC valid in any coordinate system either A or C or whatever you have. Now there is the subscripts are specifically shown like this here. We always put the word with respect to between the two subscripts. And as you see on the right hand side the A subscripts are adjacent and uh, we can therefore say all right we can cancel them in order to get the subscripts on the left hand side. And that cancellation or that kind of arrangement is called the concatenation rule which is very convenient if you have a lot of geometry, a lot of position points uh, and to keep them straight in your simulation uh, 
you always can use this concatenation rule without having to think about it any further. So in components, uh, on the left hand side, uh, we express these components. Now since these are all radius vectors, they have to be expressed in their respective coordinate system. On the right hand side, uh, we just got three components, three by one matrices, and uh, they can be expressed in any coordinate system. So we got a problem on the left hand side because the RCA, the left part, well it's really the radius vector which only is defined in the C coordinate system, but we got to have it here in the A coordinate system. The same thing true here, the Q superscript C is only defined in the C coordinates. But again, in order to make this an addition, we have to express it in the A coordinates. Not so on the right hand side. Because these are tensors, we just can express them in any coordinate system. And in this case, we pick the A coordinate system. Now what happens if we use the C coordinates? Again, on the left hand side, we got a problem because this radius vector A is only defined in the A coordinate, but we have to express it in the C coordinates. On the right hand side, no problem. We can express them in the C coordinates. These are now three by one matrices again. The conclusion is that in vector kinematics, the radius vector is not a tensor. It does not have tensor characteristics because of these conflicts of expressing them in a coordinate system that they are not defined in. But on the right hand side, the displacement vector is a tensor of rank 1 and can be expressed in any coordinate system. Well, when I say any, I really mean any admissible coordinate system, and in our case these are the Cartesian coordinate systems. Well now let's turn to velocity, and it gets even more interesting. In vector kinematics if we want to express the velocity of B with respect to coordinate system A, we just take the ordinary time derivative of the radius vector r with respect to that coordinate system a. Now in tensor kinematics, again the coordinate systems have no origins, but we have point b related to point a with this part of frame a and the velocity of point B relative to frame A as shown here point B relative to frame A equals the rotational derivative with respect to frame A of this displacement tensor of rank 1 of point B with respect to point A. So in tensor kinematics uh, we have quite a different approach to calculating the velocity. Now if we want to express this velocity in a C coordinate, on the left hand side we have this additional term which is the angular velocity of coordinate system C with respect to coordinate system A multiplied by that radius vector. So there's this extra term again. On the right hand side we just apply a coordinate transformation from coordinate system A to coordinate system C through the transformation matrix coordinate system C with respect to coordinate system A. And this is a typical tensor transformation.
that means it holds for all admissible coordinate systems. While on the left-hand side we do not have a tensor formulation because of the extra term, on the right-hand side the velocity transform is a tensor transformation. Well, this was quite a journey here, particularly if you have not been exposed to this before. But uh, the uh, tensor dynamics is supported by two additional kinematic elements. We talked about the rotational time derivative, which preserves the tensor properties, and there's some history. It goes all the way back to 1932. Wundheiler, in the Mathematische Zeitschrift, published a paper that I discovered later, and it really helped me to uh, put uh, tensor flight dynamics on a very solid mathematical basis. Matter of fact, you can see that in my textbook that I published uh, in the appendix. But you got to be quite uh, familiar with the tensor nomenclature in order to follow that derivative. Uh, the way I went was uh, I uh, discovered a book by Reed, Tensor and Vector and Tensor Analysis, published in 1963. Well, I discovered it in 1967, I believe. And uh, there is some indication of this kind of uh, treatment. And I used it in my dissertation in 1970. And you can still get that dit dissertation online. But there's this other very important kinematic element, which I call the Euler transformation, which I also derived in my dissertation. Because very often in deriv derivations, we have to change the reference frame of the rotational time derivative. And uh, this works the following way. Let's say we have a vector v, which really is a tensor rank 1 and uh, it is operated by the time derivative d operating with respect to frame b. Now we want to shift this over to a time derivative with respect to frame i. How we do this? Well, we incur an extra term, and this is the angular velocity tensor. This is a second order tensor now of a frame B with respect to frame I operating or multiplied by this vector V. So this is how we shift from frame B to frame I as we execute the rotational time derivative. And uh, as you will, as you can see in my publications, that is used f very frequently. Well, here is an example of our beloved Newton's second law. In the first line, it is referred to the inertial frame, and this is really how Newton implied it because he never really talked about coordinate systems as such. Uh, he just said, well, uh, this my law applies to a uh, inertial reference frame. Now, if you want to express this in body frame, which is a frequent transformation that we need in flight mechanics, as you see, we incur that extra term capital omega of frame B with respect to frame I multiplied by that linear momentum vector which is a tensor of, fra of rank 1. And this capital omega is a special tensor. It's a skew symmetric tensor. 
which has special characteristics. So this is how we apply the Euler transformation and that is how we apply the rotational time derivative. Well, that's the end of this section. And again, I'm going to ask you a question. How did you learn flight mechanics? Undergraduate course, maybe graduate course. Did you teach yourself? Maybe on the job training, or you may not have had any exposure. And you're still very welcome to this uh, seminar because it's supposed to be a introduction to tensor flight dynamics. Now I learned um, flight mechanics as a graduate course at the University of Stuttgart and we had the honor to have as instructor a very famous man, Stümke, Dr. Stümke. The, re the reason he was famous because after the war, when I took that course, he just came from Peenemünde after some side trips and started to teach flight mechanics at uh, Stuttgart. And the reason he was famous because he was the one who derived and calculated all the ballistics for the V2 rocket. So that's how I got started. All right, uh, let's pause here and uh, then we're going to go to our next section, section three. <laughs> I mentioned to you that I took my first steps in flight mechanics at the University of Stuttgart under Professor Stübke. Once I graduated, uh, I came over here and attended Catholic University, where Professor Fang introduced me into the usage of matrices in flight mechanics, which has then expanded into tensors for my dissertation. And now today we call this tensor flight dynamics. What is it good for? Why should you change? Well, I will give you some examples, like uh, the six degrees of freedom equations of motion of aerospace vehicles, and the so important perturbation approach to flight dynamics that linearizes the problem, and particularly uh, with tensor flight dynamics, we can now derive the perturbation equations of unsteady flight. And then I will wrap it up for you with a very practical missile example. Mm -hmm. give you now a brief overview how I model flight phenomena for computer simulations. I will derive the six stuff equations of motions for you and give you a brief look at perturbation methods. And these methods I apply to a very important missile stability problem where I will show you the nonlinear aerodynamic and unsteady effects on its trajectory. I use tensor flight dynamics to streamline the modeling of my flight mechanics problems. It enables me to create complex aerospace simulations by modeling with tensors and programming with matrices which means I separate physics from computation. So I delay the introduction of coordinate systems until I really need it for programming and on computers. And also tensor flight dynamics now enables me to solve stability problems of unsteady flight. 
by linearizing the equations of motions of maneuvering flight, but keeping these unsteady effects uh, alive. But let's first look at uh, the elements of modeling, some simple things, particularly nomenclature and uh, how I'm using these symbols. Well, my modeling hypothesis is a very important one. Points and frames are sufficient to model any dynamic problem. This is a hypothesis I formulated uh, for my dissertation, and that was 50 years ago. And nobody yet has shown me that this hypothesis is not valid. So I'm still using it, and it is reflected in my formulating the nomenclature. And here are some examples. Well, we got an aircraft on that figure, uh, B. Point B is the center of mass. Uh, B is also the frame of the aircraft. It has a velocity of its center of mass B with respect to inertial frame. And you see here the inertial frame is this uh, plate down there on the ground. And there's a point I, which is part of the inertial frame. So the displacement vector SPI is the displacement of the center of mass of the aircraft relative to this reference point I. And that is the first example I'm showing you here. It's the displacement vector. Two subscripts because two points are involved. We already talked about velocity vector also. So it's the velocity of point B relative to inertial frame I. And then we have the linear momentum vector of point B with respect to reference frame I and the angular velocity vector of frame B with respect to I. And here is something new. It's the angular momentum vector. And it has three sub and superscripts. It's the angular momentum of frame B, that is the airframe of the aircraft, relative to the inertial frame, but reference to the center of mass of the aircraft. And the moment of inertia tensor has two sub and subscripts. It's the moment of inertia of frame B of the aircraft referenced to point B, which is here the center of mass. And then we got a new tensor, which is a second order tensor. And it is the relationship of frame B with respect to frame I, the orientation of B with respect to frame I. So my convention is points are subscripts and frames are superscripts. And I have been true to this convention ever since my dissertation. So it still works for me today. Well, let's go towards the derivation of the six stuff equations of motions of aerospace vehicles. We start with this tensor formulation. Well, it's Newton's law. It's mass times the rotational derivative with respect to inertial frame of the velocity of this aircraft center of mass B relative to the inertial frame equals on the right hand side the applied forces. They are aerodynamic forces, propulsive forces, and then uh, gravitational forces. We now apply the Euler transformation to shift the rotational time derivative from frame I to frame B. And as you may remember, that incurs this additional term. M omega BI times VBI. And this omega BI is a second order tensor, matter of fact, a special one, a skew symmetric tensor, of frame B relative to I.
So that's all there is to physics. Now we want to go to computation. So we apply a coordinate system. In this case, we apply the body coordinate system across the equation. And we indicate this now by the square brackets. And those are now matrices. So we got the rotational derivative expressed in B coordinates. And because the rotational derivative is with respect to frame B and also expressed in a coordinate system that is associated with that frame B, it becomes a ordinary derivative as you see below. And that is very important because uh, we can only program ordinary derivatives. So uh, we plot uh, that extra term to the right-hand side. And here you see the aerodynamics and propulsive forces expressed in body coordinates. Now the gravitational acceleration is best expressed in in geographic coordinates g, so that's why we have to pre-multiply that by a transformation matrix of body coordinates relative to geographic coordinates. Let's look at the uh, attitude equations which are based on Euler's law. Now I haven't mentioned Euler's law, but that's used to uh, derive the attitude equations. In tensor form, again it's the rotational time derivative with respect to I of this product, which is the moment of inertia tensor times the angular velocity of the aircraft. And that equals the externally applied moments reference to the moment of inertia. Again, we're going to subject it to an Euler transformation and incur that extra term. And now we apply the product rule to this time derivative. So we really would have two terms. I'm showing you the first term, which is the moment of inertia taken out, multiplied by the uh, rotation derivative with respect to body B now of the angular velocity body B relative to inertial frame. Now the second term, which would be the rotational derivative with respect to the moment of inertia term, has been shown to be small and can be neglected. For computation again, uh, we apply the body coordinates across and uh, the moment of inertia tensor who has become a moment of inertia matrix, three by three matrix, is now on the right hand side and we got to take the inverse of that matrix and then multiply it by this uh, extra term and uh, the uh, moments that act on the center of mass B. And those moments are really usually just aerodynamic moments. Now the more difficult subject are the perturbation methods. What's the methodology? Well, we derive linear perturbation equations relative to a reference flight profile. And this reference flight may be steady or unsteady. Steady means like an aircraft flying at constant speed and constant altitude. Unsteady means like that aircraft now makes a maneuver like a pitch-up maneuver. So its angular velocity is not zero any longer. And we're going to look at those unsteady effects. But before we do this, we have to look at three types of perturbations. Uh, the first one are the scalar perturbations. And as you see uh, on this picture, we have a reference flight called X sub R and a perturbed flight X sub P. 
and the differences of these elements, there are three elements to this vector, constitute scalar perturbations. Now, total perturbations are favored by the physicist, and uh, here we subtract not the components, but the actual vectors, and formulate the perturbation delta x. My preference is shown here, called the component perturbations. And that looks somewhat more complicated right now. Well, the component perturbations indicated by the epsilon x equals the perturbed flight minus the reference flight, but this reference flight has been projected or is being projected into the perturbed flight by this rotation tensor. It's the rotation tensor of the uh, perturbed flight with respect to the reference flight. So these are three methodologies, scalar perturbations, uh, particularly used in flight dynamics uh, based on Etkin. And Etkin was the seminal book that uh, we all grew up on well uh, in 1959 when it was published and I was there at the uh, Helicopter Institute in Germany. We all got a copy of it and we were very happy to have finally in our hands a flight mechanics book that was quite complete. And Atkins even today is still uh, quite popular but it is somewhat uh, dated and uh, new books have been published. But these new books all still use scalar perturbations. It's only my book, which I published in 2000 and is now in its third edition, 2014, that's where I used the component perturbations. And the justification for that is because with this I can derive the perturbation equations of unsteady flight. Let's look at some pictures and compare these perturbations. Here we have the scalar perturbations. Well, we got the aircraft, we got body coordinates 1b, 2b, 3b, we got uh, the velocity vector VBR, which is the reference velocity vector relative to inertial, and the VBPI, which is the perturbed velocity vector. And each of these vectors has components along the three body coordinates. And I'm showing that here on the right-hand side. So we got the perturbed components minus the reference component, which result then in these scalar perturbations. That's the traditional way. Now the physicist, uh, he looks at it differently. He talks about a perturbed flight and a reference flight. Here the perturbed flight is red, reference flight is black, and we have separated out the velocity vectors, the perturbed velocity vector here, and the reference velocity vector, and uh, we show that vector triangle on the right-hand side. And these are the uh, total perturbations. Now for computation we have to express them in matrices. And uh, we have to apply the same coordinate system across the board. That's how we get to matrices. But because only the reference flight is known in the reference quantum system, we have to pre-multiply it by this transformation matrix. 
which is the transformation of the perturbed coordinates relative to the reference coordinates. And this causes us some problems when we use this approach of total perturbations in flight mechanics. Because of this, uh, I developed a third way of doing perturbations, which is the component perturbations. Now here we have again a reference flight, perturbed flight, but we project also the perturbed flight attitudes into the reference flight. This is the tensor formulation and because of that projection we have this rotation tensor of the perturbed frame BP relative to the reference frame BR. So that looks quite complicated uh, in tensor formulation. However, when we apply that to matrices, this rotation tensor multiplied by the transformation matrix becomes the unit matrix. And therefore we have this simple relationship between these perturbed and reference velocities, which is also shown here in components, which looks very much like the scalar perturbations up there. However, it has the advantage that it is based on a true tensor formulation, which the scalar perturbations are not. So with this introduction to the three types of perturbations, I'm going to show you these perturbation equations of unsteady flight. Now I don't give you the derivation. The derivation is, as you can imagine, rather complex. Uh, it is given in my textbook that I mentioned. But let's just look at it. Well, I've given you all the definitions down here and what they mean, but I'm going to lead you through here. First of all, the perturbations are epsilon VBI. Those are the state variables. They show up here, <coughs> show up again here. And what we have here is the rotational derivative with respect to the perturbed so this term here is an unsteady term indicated by this omega bri, which is the angular velocity of the reference flight. Now, if that aircraft just flies straight and steady, that would be zero. But if it maneuvers either pitch up, pitch down, or makes a maneuver to the right or left, that term is non-zero. And here is actually a coupling term. This is here the state variable of the uh, attitude equation of motion, which I'm going to show in a minute. And there's this coupling into here from the attitude motions. On the right-hand side, we got uh, aerodynamic perturbations, thrust perturbations, and this here is the perturbations of the gravity. again uh, indicated by this rotation tensor. Well, let's move to the attitude equations. Here the state variables is the omega, epsilon omega. It shows up here and shows up here, but as I just mentioned, it also shows up here in its second order tensor, skew symmetric second order tensor form. The unsteady terms are two of them, 
indicated by this omega BRI and he omega BRI. Now, the perturbations are uh, subject to the rotational time derivative with respect to the perturbed flight, pre-multiplied by this moment of, of inertia tensor. That shows up here and shows up here. And actually, this is here the moment of inertia tensor during the reference flight. So take some time and look at these, and uh, I have given you all the details below. You can stop me here, you know, and uh, go back and go forward. That's the big advantage of these seminars that are not uh, real time. So it's not a webinar, it's just a seminar. Well, we want to program that. So how do these equations look in matrix form? We apply the equation, uh, the quantum system of the perturbed flight here, which makes this rotational derivative that we had before now an ordinary derivative. And again, we only can program ordinary derivatives. Now here we got the reference cordon system. We got here the perturbed cordon system. We got the perturbed cordon system, the reference cordon system. And on the right-hand side, the perturbed cordon system. And uh, here, this uh, is the effect that gravity has on these perturbations. So the linear differential equation in perturbations has these state variables, epsilon VBI, omega, epsilon omega BI, which here is in its Q-symmetric form because that's the coupling term, and also the transformation matrix between the perturbed coordinates and the reference coordinates is also part of the perturbation. The attitude equations are also expressed here in perturbed coordinates, perturbed coordinates, reference coordinates, And on the right-hand side, uh, the perturbations in aerodynamics and in thrust. Now, the state variables are these omegas. And they show up here as the derivative, and then uh, in here. And also in here, in its skew-symmetric form. And, of course, up here also. So, again, uh, you need to look at this for a while. If you're not familiar with it, it may be rather uh, difficult to follow. But I just want to give you an impression on how tensor flight dynamics allows us to derive the perturbation equations of unsteady flight. And now we're going to apply that to a very important missile program. So here we got uh, a missile that is launched against a blue aircraft. The launch point is here, the intercept point down here, and the missile makes a very se serious maneuver here for the intercept. As a matter of fact, it peaks at 6 Gs and at a side slip angle of up to 40 degrees and a yaw rate of 250 degrees per second. So that is a very challenging problem, but important because it happens in air-to-air -air combat. Uh, 
and uh, the control engineer has to be aware of it and design his control system to stabilize that missile so it can make an effective intercept. So let's look at the equations that really are based on what I showed before, but now, of course, after very many manipulations, uh, they come down to this form, and these are the translational equations. Well, let's look at this figure first. We got, again, body axis, 1B, 2B, 3B. We have the linear perturbations, U, V, W. We got the angular perturbations, P, roll, Q, pitch, and R, yaw. And then we got uh, aerodynamic forces, X, Y, Z, and the rolling moment, pitching moment, and yawing moment. Now we look at the equations. Well, here is the derivative of the state variable u and v and w. These terms are the dynamic terms. Then we got the aerodynamic terms. And finally, the gravitational effects. So in the U channel, I have indicated the unsteady effects. Well, R sub R is the uh, yaw rate during that engagement, which I showed you is 250 degrees per second. And also the VR really represents the side slip angle, because it's the lateral velocity, which is also very significant and they couple respectively into the V perturbation and into the R perturbations. Now in the V channel, we just have one term, which is the yaw rate that uh, couples into the U perturbations. And in the W channel, it is the VR, uh, reference that couples into the roll perturbations. The attitude equations are somewhat simpler. We got P, Q, R, the state variables, roll, pitch, and yaw. Uh, L is the moment, rolling moment. M, the pitching moment, and the yawing moment. And we got here one coupling, and it is the yaw rate that couples into the pitch channel in the presence of roll perturbations. So if this missile has significant roll perturbations, the uh, yaw rate reference becomes active and couples into the pitch equations. <laughs> All right, so do we have any roll perturbations? Well, we're looking now at the aerodynamics. And there is an aerodynamic rolling moment derivative due to alpha and beta excursions. Now, this is a nonlinear aerodynamic derivative, so that's a nonlinear aerodynamic effect. I've shown you this here in a plot. What I'm plotting is actually Cl alpha versus beta for various Mach numbers. And you see there's quite a bit of Mach number dependence and beta dependence particularly at subsonic speeds all the way up to transonic speeds. There's quite an effect in beta and also in CL alpha. But as we go supersonic, particularly high supersonic, this effect uh, 
decreases significantly. So what does that CL alpha beta do to our role degree of freedom? Well, I have expanded on the right-hand side the derivatives. There is a linear rolling derivative. This is the roll control derivative. And there is this nonlinear derivative, a function of alpha and beta. Now, since alpha and beta is not zero throughout this flight, there will be a coupling into the roll channel. And we're going to look at this now in a simulation that I did. This is a simulation, six degrees of freedom, but without an autopilot. And because the missile is overall aerodynamically stable, I could do this. But I wanted to show you that uh, the alpha and side slip excursions are here shown, and it's particularly the alpha excursion is significant, but there's also a beta excursion. And because of that, that CL alpha beta derivative is non-zero and causes roll excursions in this pitch loop. And I've shown you here the roll excursions in red. And they kind of settle out uh, at 600 degrees per second. So that's pretty significant. And because of that, we have this pitch oscillations. And I'm showing them here, the pitch oscillations. And they grow up significantly. So because of the aerodynamic cross-coupling, we have a roll excursion which couples into pitch. And the control engineer needs to know this and needs to test his control system in order to suppress these effects. And that is quite an important part of the aerodynamicist of the one that formulates the uh, equations of motions, the one who linearizes these equations of motions so that the control engineer can design his autopilot. But uh, we need to be aware that, uh, particularly in missile dynamics, there may be aerodynamic cross-coupling, nonlinear aerodynamics, and also cross-coupling of these unsteady effects. Well, this was quite uh, a uh, long story of tensor flight mechanics and uh, its benefits. And as you see, its benefits are really that we can now go and uh, look at some more sophisticated effects that uh, some of these aero vehicles may exhibit. But I'm going to ask you now, are you interested in giving TensorFlight Dynamics a try? Well, obviously, I already do. I've done that for 50 years. Uh, maybe you will do this very soon, maybe later, or maybe not at all. And possibly uh, you are... Uh, a physicist, for instance, and it really doesn't apply to you. Well, uh, it really helped me to uh, model and simulate very sophisticated effects of all kinds of uh, aerospace vehicles, aircraft, missiles, rockets, and hypersonic vehicles. <laughs>
But before we go forward, we'll go back and talk about its history. Well, it has a long history as reflected in the many simulations that I built using TensorFlow Dynamics, taking advantage of its features from tensor modeling to matrix computation. Let's pick up now and look where we have come from. And so talk about the history of flight dynamics. Well, it is 50 years since flight dynamics was initially presented in my dissertation in 1970. And in 1973, I attended my first AAA conference and presented that paper, Perturbation Methods in Atmospheric Flight Dynamics, which then was published in the AIAA journal. And uh, fast forward to 2000, uh, after teaching uh, flight dynamics at the University of Florida, I published my graduate textbook, Modeling and Simulation of Aerospace Vehicle Dynamics, which, as I mentioned, is now in its third edition. And during that time, I also was working for the United States Air Force, and jointly with the University of Florida, I created uh, the simulation environment called CADEC++. That plus plus stands for C++. Originally CADEC, as I conceived it back in the 70s, was uh, in Fortran, and then uh, in 2001, I converted it to C++. And my paper that I published in 1973 was recognized in 2011 at the AIAA GNC conference as, I quote here, the most important contribution to flight dynamics in the 70s. I also was asked uh, not just to have this graduate textbook, but to condense it down to an undergraduate level. And I published that book in 2020, which is now in its second edition in 2021. So here is a big list of simulations I created both for the uh, University of Florida, of course, with the help of my students, and then the ones that are shaded in blue uniquely for the United States Air Force while I was working at the Air Force Research Lab. So in the left-hand side, you see what kind of simulation there are cruise missiles, fighter aircraft, air-to-ground missiles, aerial missiles, the National Aerospace Plane, which is a hypersonic plane, a generic defense missile, and a three-stage booster. And down there in the blue are those things that are simulations that I created for the Air Force. Now go over uh, two vertical columns and we talk about the degrees of freedom. As you see, most of these simulations were created in the full six degrees of freedom. There are only two in five degrees, but I also had uh, other simulations in three degrees of freedom, and usually three degrees and five degrees build up to the eventual full-fledged six degrees of freedom. The simulations have different Earth models as they require anywhere from spherical to flat Earth and to a model called WGS84, which is an elliptical Earth model. And then on the right hand side, there are some of the specific features of these simulations. So uh, if you're interested, uh, you can get uh, these uh, academic simulations by going to my AIAA website of my textbook and there on the supporting uh, material uh, you can download these simulations together with what's called CADEX Studio, a plotting program uh, 
which has been around for quite a while and now is also compatible with Windows 10. So let's summarize briefly. Why TensorFlight Dynamics? And what is it? Well, it applies the covariance principle to flight dynamics using tensors. And these tensors are invariant under time-dependent coordinate transformations. And here is my motto from tensor modeling to matrix coding with these three steps. Formulate equations of motions in tensors, select coordinate systems, obtain the matrices, and then code either in C++, MATLAB, Simulink, or more recently in Python, which is quite a nice language. I talked about perturbations. As we linearized equations in tensors, and then pick coordinate systems to express them in matrices for programming. As you have seen, we can do quite sophisticated things with these perturbation matrices. So, uh, for your usage, if you want to go further with this, there are resources from AIAA based on my lectures at the University of Florida on the left hand side is the cover of the third edition of my graduate textbook and on the right hand side are three CDs that I published well actually AIAA published uh, these are based on courses I taught anywhere from uh, building aerospace simulation in C++ to fundamentals of six degrees of freedom, aerospace simulations and analysis, and then an advanced course in C++. So these are uh, CDs that reflect uh, my lectures and also the problems, and I include the solutions. Now, with my company, Modeling and Simulation Technology, I published two books, an introductory book that I mentioned, which is the undergraduate text, and then on the right-hand side, an advanced book that uh, treats INS GPS star trackers in six degrees of freedom using a three-stage booster, and I do this all in my code CADAC++. More recently, I published four workbooks that give you a quick overview over these topics. Well, an overview over flight dynamics. And if you are ambitious enough, you can do it in three days. And then an introduction to C++. Again, you can do it in two days, or you can take longer, of course. And the third one uh, is rather uh, code-intensive because it looks at missile and rocket simulations in four days. And these simulations are most of them all in six degrees of freedom. So that's a more intense course. Therefore, it takes four days or more. And just recently, I published a Tensor Flight Dynamics workshop in two days, which is kind of an extension of uh, this seminar and an extension of the course that I have published and uh, gi I'm given on Udemy. And this is an introductory course, Flight Dynamics with Tensors. Well, now it's your turn to tell me how you liked my seminar. Was it boring? Did it meet your expectations? Or even maybe I was able to exceed your expectations. Now, you can't tell me directly, but uh, I would appreciate if you give me an email feedback over Udemy. What 
uh, is your takeaway from this course? Very briefly stated, remember Newton's law abides by the postulates of general relativity. Therefore, classical dynamics is a subset of general relativity, just like Einstein always maintained. And what are those key elements of this tensorial formulation of Newtonian dynamics? Well, you have to distinguish now between frames and coordinate systems. And there are two kinematic elements that make it possible for this invariant presentation. It is the rotational time derivative and the Euler transformation. And what are now the practical benefits of flight dynamics? Well, you probably can tell me now. First of all, it puts it under the umbrella of the most general knowledge of dynamics, which is based on general relativity, but also very practical because now we can solve problems that were very difficult before to solve with the vector mechanics. And we can build very sophisticated simulations. Well, we have come to the end. And out of gratitude to Albert Einstein, who made it possible for me to formulate my tensor flight dynamics. And as a thank you to you also, I will play a little farewell song for Albert and for you. <laughs>